thank y'all for showing up. Y'all is Texas for all of you. I see a Texan out there. Uh, this is Fair Observer hosting a discussion on India as a driver of growth. And uh, we have a lot of eminent people here. We also have Atul. <laughs> Not so uh, eminent. So I want to start off with brief introductions of everyone. Uh, first off, uh, I'll start off with you, Atul. Uh, Atul is uh, editor-in-chief and founder of Fair Observer. Uh, he has been uh, working on Fair Observer, which is a global newspaper, in addition to Fair Observer Intelligence, uh, which seeks to uh, assist groups in understanding their place in the world and what concerns they have. Uh, I'm also pleased to be joined by Glenn Carl, to my far right, he is the retired CIA officer, former U.S. Dep Deputy National Intelligence Officer, and he is a senior partner at Fair Observer Intelligence. Um, to look over, we have Neil Tata Mishra, who is the a professor of computer science. Uh, and though she denies it, she is uh, considered one of the leading figures who is respected by industry in this field. I put it in anyway. Um, and lastly, we have Sunil Parekh. He tells me so long as I don't call him a parrot, we're in good shape. Uh, his background is long and extensive. He uh, handed me a business card uh, that folded like a piece of origami. Um, but I will read you a few brief points as to his background. Um, he is the founding curator at AGS, an initiative of the World Economic Forum, Geneva, and a member of FICCI National Executive Council. Uh, I'm Christopher Roper Shell. I am a contributing editor at Fair Observer, a partner at Fair Observer Intelligence. I spent well over a decade on Capitol Hill and a year at the Pentagon. I also made a, uh, an attempt at the US Congress uh, I am uh, not dead yet, so we'll, we'll see how that goes. Now, I want to start off uh, with a question for you, Glenn. Uh, I was listening to your podcast with Atul uh, about China, and my question is simple. Is the China story over and is the, uh, or ending, I suppose, and is the India story just beginning? Well, first of all, uh, apologize for walking in a couple of minutes later, but I was being educated. Um, and since that is an infinite project, uh, at least with respect to me, I, it took longer than we anticipated. Um, I was learning some fascinating things ongoing about uh, learning uh, here at the university. It, but that's not why we're here, although I, I could have stayed forever and, and listened. So the, I, I, the question is put, of course, intentionally uh, in a an ironic different way, but but the simple answer I would argue is um, sort of uh, meaning that uh, China obviously has become one of the you can still hear okay uh, one of the uh, two or three uh, world powers at present, and the trajectory of um, increasing strength and uh, market share and various disciplines economically, um, cutting edge uh, technology and uh, research and development. By most of these indices, China will continue to, to grow and occupy a larger, more defining, shaping part of the uh, international uh, economy, political system. I'm not sure about cultural influence so much. That said, uh, we all tend to focus on those trends that we've seen for uh, certainly 30 years uh, in uh, China. <clears throat> there are, however, um, other, in some ways, deeper uh, trends that, that would indicate that in some ways China is, uh, if not having peaked, is approaching a peak. The uh, labor force in China already is shrinking and has for, I believe, the last five years. There are literally fewer hands to work in China 
uh, every year, although the population continues to grow. But that itself will stop. Uh, China's peak population will probably be reached in the next decade, I believe. There are also disturbing trends, and, and this is, I really believe what I'm going to say now is not a polemical partisan uh, comment uh, of an American rival of uh, China, but uh, the current president of China is um, attempting to purify, in some ways, you might argue, uh, the Chinese system, but, but by placing greater controls uh, of or from the Chinese Communist Party on all levels of economic activity, education, political discourse, news, uh, information dissemination, the, um, these steps are starting to threaten the uh, goose that lays the golden eggs, uh, if not to kill it, I don't think they'll kill it, but uh, it, it should be simply an accepted, uh, proven truth that um, diversity of opinion, uh, challenge to assumptions, uh, multiple power centers, which is the issue for Chinese government, uh, create sometimes friction and cacophony, but uh, greater growth. You know, the reason the birds fly slowly in New Zealand is because there are no predators. There's no challenge. The reason the birds fly much more quickly in North America and everywhere else in the world is because there are predators who challenge them and they must learn how to fly faster to survive. And they are in that sense, better birds. Um, and I think the uh, concentration of power, purification of the control system that Xi Jinping is engaging in does endanger this, um, what has been, I think the, the most astounding and greatest uh, development economically, politically, technologically of any society in history over the last 30 years. Uh, somewhat similar, even broader question for you, Atul. Um, you're an editor of a global newspaper. You travel around the world, you give speeches. Um, about global economy and world history. How would you situate India in the global context? I think uh, if we look at the global economy across space and time, there are inflection points. Now, there was, I don't want to go too far back into the past. I could go to the 1500s, I could go to 1600s. Uh, and that would be too arcane. But if we look at a key inflection point in the global economy that the year is 1945, the post-war order which the US creates at the end of World War II is dramatically different to the post-war order created at the end of the Treaty of Versailles. It's a rules-based order. Yes, the US writes the rules, and the US writes the rules to its advantage, but it is a dramatically different world to 1919. What do I mean by that? The Bretton Woods institutions come into being. The International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. GATT kicks off, which then becomes the WTO, the World Trade Organization. But there is talk of a free trade agreement across many countries. So the world economy at this moment has the USA as top dog, Europe is ruined, Europe has very little industry, cities have been bombed out, the US has a dominant industrial base, um, the US also has massive financial resources, and the US goes on to fund the reconstruction of Japan, South Korea, and Europe, of course, the fabled Marshall Plan. So the post-war order continues, and yes, of course, the Soviet Union tries to create an alternative and tries to have communism and its um, watered-down version, socialism, as an alternative. But all of that ends in 1991. In 1991, you have the triumph of the American model. And 
in 2001, China joins the WTO. So 2001, America suffers 9-11 and China joins the WTO and the global economy shifts because the Chinese focus on production. They began reform in 1978 under Deng Xiaoping, who said it doesn't matter if a cat is black or white as long as it catches mice. And that process accelerates after 1992, when Deng goes on the southern tour, Nangshun, because there is this fear after 1991 that hang on a minute, hang on a minute. If the Chinese Communist Party was to liberalize, if it went down that path of perestroika, then China may implode. And Deng says, no, we have no choice but to press full steam ahead. So they study the Soviet Union, they choose perestroika, they say bye-bye to glasnost, which is political openness. And China emerges as the workshop of the world. 2001, that process accelerates even further. The big hit to this model comes in 2007, 2008, the financial crisis. And I was in the city of London then, and I saw it from the inside. And I remember the heady, frothy days where valuations would go up from, say, 12 billion to 15, 18, 19 in days. It was madness. It was beyond madness. And I don't want to go into the causes of the 2007, 2008 crisis, but in the aftermath of that crisis came quantitative easing and, of course, some fiscal easing too. So you had both fiscal and monetary easing. And what is known in, in economic jargon is pump priming the economy and that averted what some may call a depression. But that world continued largely as it is. Yes, the big banks profited, too big to fail became even bigger to fail, moral hazard, which is term for once you get fire insurance, you take less care of your house, that amplified, but the system didn't implode. With the Russia-Ukraine war, I am firmly in the camp that that post-war order is dead, c'est fini, c'est tout. It is a new world we live in. Now, COVID had already hit that world. Why? Because talk of nearshoring, French shoring, the fact that if your supply chains were too long, you may not get medical equipment. That had already come into being, but now the supply side shock, particularly given that Russia is the biggest exporter of natural gas. We know headlines over the last day or two about Russia playing footsie with the Nord Stream. So the largest supplier of nat natural gas, Russia. The second largest supplier of oil, Russia. The third largest exporter of coal, Russia. Nickel, Russia. We could go on. Food grains, Russia and Ukraine. This massive supply side shock after a period of excessively loose monetary policy has meant that inflation is roaring through the global economy. As I was preparing for this session, I was reading the Financial Times and Britain is in crisis again. And in a major crisis, the Bank of England is reassuring financial markets. They're like cats on a hot tin roof because of a budget that is a bit too loose. So, and that'll add to inflationary pressures. So what we know is that Europe is going to go through recession, if not depression. Demography is against Europe, and now they have inflation too. America is largely insulated, and America has its own natural gas, and America has a lot of advantages, but America is also in trouble. It's arguably in recession already. And the benefits of Biden's stimulus, if they arrive, will come in a year or two. They aren't coming today. China, because of its zero COVID policy, and I call Xi Emperor Xi Jinping, has basically driven the Middle Kingdom into the ground. It is an asinine policy. It is a policy of diktat. It is reminiscent of 
the emperor deciding to burn the fleet that had sailed to Africa. I take a very dim view of Xi. He's no dung. He didn't walk in the long march. He hasn't had to struggle. He's a princeling. And so bright though he may be, he thinks the economy can dance to his tunes and the zero COVID policy is decimating China. And China is not trusted anymore. When you start making aggressive noises about Taiwan, when you send troops over against your southern, southern neighbor, India, when you act as a bully and sail with the Russians around Japan, which the Russian and Chinese fleet did last year, they sailed around Honshu, we have some Japanese in the audience, and they can tell you that Japan is petrified by the most recent developments. We have a number of Japanese friends, whether they are, they are generals in the army or captains in the Navy or leaders of industry, they're all nervous. So if you are a global company, do you really want to source your production in China? Do you really trust them with, um, with technology? They've been stealing technology for years. And do you really want greater integration with a country that could accidentally trigger World War III? And so given the fact that Europe is in recession, Africa is going through a debt crisis, Latin America, which is a commodity supplier, is imploding, the US is going to meander over the next two years, the bright spots in the world economy are few. Capital has to come to a few places. Production has to shift. Supply chains have to change. Places that will benefit are the likes of Vietnam, which have experience of manufacturing, and they're rather good at it. They are better friends, safer spots. But the economy with the scale and size that could absorb that investment and that could benefit from this tectonic shift, that could benefit from what the German chancellor calls Zeitenwende, is India. Now it is up to India to grab the moment. The last time India had a moment, particularly after independence, Jawaharlal Nehru squandered it. He brought in five-year plans inspired by the Soviet Union, but imposed by a colonial bureaucracy that didn't know numbers, the Indian Administrative Service. And he left us with a Hindu rate of growth and an underdeveloped, impoverished, malnourished country. Now, we have another moment where we can bend the arc of destiny to our will. The question is, do we have the will? Tool gave us a master class on history and economics, as always. Uh, so I have a slew of notes um, on things you just mentioned, principally the implosion of China, either by virtue of COVID and the strong lockdowns, um, the supply chain issues you suggested, the reliability of China as an economic partner in terms of production um, and intellectual property, seem to create fertile ground for India, as you mentioned. Um, the Prime Minister Narendra Modi has spoken often of a $5 trillion economy in the next year or two. So uh, that would be a substantial growth in the course of very few years from 3.5 to 5 trillion. Um, World Bank IMF say in the next five years, it will go from 3.5 to 5.5. Nonetheless, these are huge growth numbers. Um, India has a young population, over half is under age 30. In China, you have about 35, 6, 7% uh, under age 30. So these are all great things for India. Uh, my question for Sunil is, given that um, fertile environment, what do you see as drivers of the Indian economy and thus global growth? Uh, first of all, uh, thanks very much, Atul, for this invitation. Very nice to see Glenn again in, in person instead of on the monthly reviews. 
and Chris, very nice to meet you and my good friend, Neil. Uh, let, me, let me begin with a little bit of, uh, you know, a perspective on the Indian economy. Uh, in the year 1950, the Indian economy was $30 billion. It's now about $3.1, $3.2 trillion, which makes it a hundredfold growth in a period of 70 years. What is surprising is that we are now, it was in 1950, the sixth largest economy in the world. Even today, we are the sixth largest economy. Recently, we have taken over Britain and therefore it makes it the fifth. So to put things into perspective that, you know, while we have grown a lot, you know, our ranking hasn't changed much. When I apply the same logic to the per capita income, the per capita income in India was uh, in the year uh, was uh, roughly about $50 per head in the year 1950, which is a little about $2,000 today, which has grown about 40 times. But in both the years, in the year 1950 and in the year 2020, it's roughly 15% of the global average of GDP. It's a very sobering thought because currently what we are experiencing is a euphoria. And I would like to draw your attention to the fact that we've had, as Atul rightly mentioned, in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, and half of 80s, were three, three and a half decades where a rank which was the sixth largest economy in the world dropped to the 13th in terms of rank. We didn't keep pace with the rest of the world. But since then, since 1980, 1990, we've been growing at a much faster pace and therefore, we are now being able to catch up the gap of almost four decades in a matter of three decades. And that really speaks August very well when we look at the future. The anticipation, sir, is that uh, even if we continue to grow between seven to seven and a half percent, which is like a given in the Indian economy, given the rate of growth, given the younger people and the need for health, education, infrastructure, the physical manufacturing capabilities that we require, even discounting a large or having a moderate rate of exports, the 7.5 figure is like a golden rule, barring aside anything unforeseen that happens either from nature or from our neighbors. If this were to happen over a period of uh, 2025 years to 1947, a simple compounding will show you that India will become a $20 trillion economy the size of the US today by the year 2047. Now, what are these factors that are likely to drive this economy? Primarily, I think one of the major reasons that we have today is that the domestic economy accounts for almost two thirds of our GDP in India. And the other three factors, which is the government investments, the net exports and investments by the private sector, these account for only about a third. So even with an environment, an international or a global environment, which is relatively dull, the chances are that India will sail through with a seven, seven and a half percent, mainly reliant on its domestic economy, which is the main driver to the question that you had asked and aided by government expenditure and private investments. So therefore that is one of the factors which is driving this economy, it's internal domestic markets. In addition to this, what we have seen since the last about a, almost a decade is a slew of reforms in several areas, which is now beginning to bear fruit in terms of being able to take the headwinds of global recession and slow down again, as Atul mentioned, with a very, very self-confident India, which has seen growth resume and the jump back from pandemic, we have now reached the same level of GDP that we had in the pre-pandemic times. And this year will be our year of net increase over the pandemic, having brushed aside all the scarring that we were afraid of because of the inherent buoyancy. The reforms have taken a very good shape. We have now today a single tax, which is GST, which has subsumed all the state level taxes, making India a single market, which was one of the biggest problems we in industry face. We also have a very large FinTech revolution taking place, inclusive financing, and the number of transactions that we are seeing in the digital economy today has surpassed everything, including China, in terms of the rate of growth. And this has helped open out and enable the rural markets, 
where about 55 to 60 percent of the people stay, open out and join into the benefits of growth. We also have a Jandan accounting system, which means one account for every person in the country, one identity card, Aadhaar for one, and mobile technologies, which is absolutely ubiquitously available and being used for making ordinary day-to-day -day payments in the remotest of villages throughout the whole of India, covering 1.3 billion people and their empowerment. And this has led to the even reluctant magazine like The Economist or The Standard and Poor, the chief economist, actually now recognize India as a force that is now going to be able to drive the global growth in the years to come. And therefore, I think the time for India is right. The digital economy is in place. It's the only real alternative to China plus one if a country wants to scale up, whether in manufacturing or in services, which is where China is lagging behind India in leaps and bounds. And these are the kinds of revolutions that I feel are really going to be able to drive us. On the infrastructure front, a humongous number of initiatives are taking place. We are building six lane highways at the speed of almost 40 kilometers per day, crisscrossing the country. This is a phenomenon of, which has no parallel in human history, including China. Similarly, if you look at the 5G rollout that is going to take place, given the fact that out of 1.3 billion people, almost 700 million people have smartphones. This helps them in health. And we have a scheme called Ayush, which enables every family to get healthcare for a very moderate premium of $10 a month for which they can do a bypass surgery, you know, which otherwise used to take them into poverty. We have in the education sector, the new education policy, which is now going to reap benefits over the medium term, where new universities, which are globally hooked up and are specialized in areas of interest, which are of strategic importance to India's future industrial development, and housing, and roads, and electricity, and power, and the renewable agenda that Mr. Modi, our Prime Minister, has announced in COP26, that 50% of our power is going to be from renewables by the year 2030. And we've already covered almost 75% of it already. And we have still more eight more years to go. So all in all, with all these factors, um, Chris, I really feel that uh, the momentum is there. The drivers of the economy are well-placed. We have a lot of inquiries coming from China plus one in the manufacturing sector. The international relationships has placed India on the global screen that it has never enjoyed. We have a seat on the big table today and our relationships are growing stronger by the day and not as an ally or whether in this camp or that camp, but as India standing on its own, which is again a relatively new, young, confident India coming on the block. Thank you. Excellent. Uh to dig down into more of a specific uh, industry or, or uh, academic pursuit, but one that's extremely important to growth, uh, I'll give you a bit more of an introduction. Uh, Neil Dada is Associate Professor of Computer Science and Engineering at IIT here. Um, and you completed your PhD in 2012 in theoretical computer science and your research interests include design and analysis of algorithms and computational social choice. I know nothing about any of those. So this is where you're gonna help me. Um, Atul and I were out in California and we heard a lot of discussion about unicorns, um, about different apps and algorithms, how this was, a, uh, there was a great deal of excitement about this. Um, when do you see that as something that's going to drive um, global growth, but also domestic Indian growth um, and I guess point two, and I don't know, you know how closely you follow this, but uh, I noted the production linked incentive scheme uh, seems to be drawing some eyeballs. I read this week that Apple is likely to shift about 5% of its iPhone production to India, ra ra raising it to 25% by 2025. JPM predicted that. Uh, and so there's going to be a great deal more production there. Foxconn, uh, a Taiwanese electronics manufacturer. Uh, is moving uh, to Gujarat. They got a $20 billion deal. So this seems very much in your kind of wheelhouse. How do you see that as driving growth? I think this is working. 
um, yeah, so uh, thanks, Atul, for the invitation to be here. Um, so um, I think I shared a lot of the optimism uh, that Sunil exhibited for the current times. You were talking about unicorns. I think we seem to be churning them out at the rate of three or four per month, which is quite incredible. And uh, clearly, they've come a long way from, say, 2005, 2006, when, um, you know, if anybody predicted that we would even have three or four unicorns altogether, then, uh, you know, you would, uh, uh, people would probably assume that you're joking or something like this. So certainly, um, you're talking about the 5G rollout now, but I think uh, uh, somewhere around, um, uh, I think when Reliance came into the market and uh, made data so cheap, and we have all these um, smartphones, which are also extremely accessible. I think that is responsible for a lot of the digital revolution that we have seen. And uh, as a result, I think uh, there is definitely um, excitement. Uh, Bangalore has been, of course, called the Silicon Valley of India for ages now. I think uh, from way back, uh, shortly after independence, I think a lot of the um, a lot of the technology sector was really servicing our needs for defense and Bangalore was considered a safe location for these industries to start out. So we go back all the way there and um, it's, I think, some of the earliest, um, some of our original gangster startups like uh, TCS and Infosys also go way back then. But I think when uh, TCS probably late um, 60s, early 70s and Infosys in the early 80s, I think, started out in a more socialistic environment, but they had a lot of challenges to deal with. But um, I think after the after the reforms in the mid 90s, I think things have really, uh, I, I think everybody knows about the kind of boom that we experienced in the tech sector. So um, as of now, we know that algorithms drive our lives, uh, starting from literally services like Uber, to Zomato and so forth. I think uh, uh, it's it's clearly an industry to watch out for. You mentioned um, Apple. I think Elon Musk has been eyeing uh, locations in India for a while now. I think uh, we're doing pretty well for ourselves as well. I think there's a great deal of um, influx among all the discussion that we have about the brain drain and leaving the country. We also have uh, the story perhaps less talked about is all the people who are coming back to India after being outside for a, for the longest time and saying, um, and I can literally quote people saying things to the effect of they feel like they've come back to a different country. And it's very confidence inspiring for them to see uh, the energy, the ease of doing business. I think Sunil mentioned a lot of specifics in that context. So all of that has been um, uh, has been sort of very, very encouraging for sure. So, so the, uh, uh, in fact, the COVID uh, times also was, I think, when we, uh, you were talking about getting ahead of China, I think this uh, uh, was in some sense, uh, I wouldn't say driven by the pandemic, but was very conspicuous during the pandemic because I think we had very contrasting approaches to uh, the tech sector while China came cracking down on a lot of the uh, you know, a lot of the companies that offered online services and so forth. Uh, uh, India was, in contrast, encouraging um, uh, encouraging companies that, that did help people sort of survive the pandemic through their digital, um, uh, through their digitized services. And I think that was the first time we even crossed China in terms of how much venture capital investment was there overall, I think, to the tune of $8 billion or so I could be slightly wrong with the numbers, but this is what memory serves. Um, so yeah, it's looking up. I don't want to put a spanner in the works, but this is not to say that there aren't a lot of challenges as well, which we should um, be mindful of. I think uh, broadly speaking, um, India is a land of contrasts. And I think one of the most uh, glaring ones is sort of the inequity that's there. We're a large nation. And um, this is low hanging fruit, so I'll pick on this. I think if you look at the trends for um, the woman in the labor force, for instance, and how much that's been dropping, I think this the optimistic view is that these are these challenges are actually opportunities for us to tap into the growth. We talked about the rural sector. I think we still have a lot of work to do in terms of making uh, or taking advantage of all the uh, 
really the, the powerhouse of talent that, that lies in that sector, but that they don't have access to at the moment. So, uh, uh, and we also talk about technology like Aadhaar and Jandhar and so on. We also are, the other side of the coin is there are significant challenges to do with privacy and people trusting these systems. And it's important that we pay attention to some of these sort of serious questions and try to um, uh, try to address them the best we can in the years to come. So I think the growth is going to be a combination of acknowledging some of these issues and doing some serious legwork in addressing them, uh, being a more inclusive workforce, addressing the inequities and trying to bring people in. I think without that, um, it's just going to be a rich gets richer kind of a, a society, which is, I mean, that's not clear to me that that's where we want to be headed. So I think some acknowledgement and recognition of the challenges and putting the work behind them will also be an important uh, driver of growth of you. So that was a meandering answer to your question. I'm afraid, but I hope it, you know. No more meandering than the guys. You did fine. <laughs> it, it was much shorter than the tools. <laughs> um, so you raise you know, the slight cloud on the horizon, right? Wealth disparities, income disparities. Everyone here has been very rosy on the future of India, but there is a global slowdown. You wouldn't know it by the Indian stock market these days, but there are some concerns that growth may be slowing. Oil is very high. There um, uh, is a conflict between Russia and Ukraine, potentially another, or at least a great deal of friction uh, with China. Um, what are the impediments? And, and I suppose, Sunil, you seem very rosy, perhaps rosier than everyone else. What, what concerns you? What could disrupt this story of growth? I have, uh, I have two major concerns. One is, as I mentioned, nature. Climate change as a major factor. And, uh, you know, if there is a carbon limitation on the total amount of carbon that India can uh, emit instead of capping the per capita carbon that a country can. If those kind of legislations come, which limits the ability of the country to generate, you know, a fixed amount of carbon as a country and not per capita, then that would necessarily require a complete reorientation of the energy systems. Now, uh, India has been fighting this battle, saying that it is iniquitous. And if, if the space around us and the air around us belongs as a common ground, as a common good, public good, then every individual in the world must have this right to the same amount of carbon. And therefore, if you have a country with large population, our footprint is necessarily going to be much higher. So that is one big concern. Change in regulation, change in legislation, change in the global dynamics of it. And associated with this is the large amount of money that is going to be required for a smooth transition to greening an economy. We have an ambitious plan which we are on track. But if tomorrow we see large amounts of floods in four or five states or a sea level water rising, then I think the time for negotiations is going to be past that. We will have to learn to deal with both uh, the adaptation costs and urgent mitigation costs, which actually could upset the entire story of growth and development in a very significant way. So that's one concern. The other concern, other than nature, is our neighbors. We live in a hostile environment. Uh, when I first heard the rumor that you know Xi Jinping could be under house arrest, I had a nice single malt that evening, hoping it was true. I'm sure you did as well in Texas. Because here is one guy who is so belligerent, he doesn't want to live and let live. He wants to assert and his only form of identity is a form of assertion and transgressions. There is nothing like living in peace for this country. Now with that kind of an atmosphere there and a neighbor that has gone broke, you know, Pakistan, we have Sri Lanka, which was up in arms and, you know, and then Myanmar, which is run by hoodlums, you know, all the military boys. We really have a pearl of necklace of failed states around us. Now this has its impact on an economy like us. Beginning with migrants, beginning with requirements of things that we had not planned for or budgeted. And a peaceful neighborhood is an essential requirement for personal peace and, you know, the stability that is required to have a good economic growth. 
and therefore these two are my primary concerns associated with this that you know we have to have a domestic reform agenda that keeps pace to the needs of the day the indian economy has now become sophisticated it's not only manufacturing it is now a service led economic growth into the future china did the manufacturing part and we are getting the spill over from china plus 1 and that is also significant but they do not have the kind of resources to drive and a global service industry which india has today and this is not only about tech it's about a variety of things whether it is healthcare whether it is education and a host of other things so the back office of the world is a reality not only in manufacturing but even in services therefore while we continue to become better in terms of competitiveness partly because it is mandatory for companies abroad to look at india as an alternative and partly because we are emerging in a competitive way with the thrust on infrastructure and the reduction reduction in the cost of doing business and the improvement in the ease of doing business the fact remains that we have a large niche that we have we can go forward and this growth is going to be ubiquitous it's not like the chinese growth model where the east coast developed they started manufacturing they invited fdi they produced for the domestic market and they produced for exports that was their model in india is going to be a whole set of people who are healthy and educated and functioning from villages we have three unicorns today in india which are operating from villages of india they have crossed 3 billion dollars in valuations today it's a new world which the economist has enumerated beautifully in that article that nothing is visible but there is so much happening here now this model of india is going to be broad based not geographically limited to a coastline not limited by virtue of that you are an oil country and you have one resource or the other resource this is about human resource it's about services it's about agriculture and agricultural exports where a very large number of people are now using new technologies and new startups as dara mentioned we have 108 unicorns and half of them are mind boggling in terms of the beautiful wonderful ideas that they have in applying existing technologies to solve very vexing problems what we call the real dreary problems of india and therefore in terms of the challenges there are three but i think the good side of the story is very strong unless we are deeply shaken which is difficult to do for an old civilization and a population of this size which has now reached 3.3 trillion dollars i don't see the downside as being very strong but i see a very positive upside so net of all when i look at the balance of the negatives and the positive i still feel bullish about india for these reasons thanks so glen sunil still feels very bullish he he uh, made lemonade out of those lemons i threw him um but with the growth of uh, india there will be uh, a lot more trade and and um commerce with the rest of the world uh with china that's created problems india right now has warming relations with the us and and uh many other countries including the west um how do we collectively manage those relationships so that they don't go the way of china so that we don't end up with a thucydides trap uh so that it doesn't become uh a hostile conflict and you know given the growth of india no one talks about this or i don't hear too many people talking about this right now but if india continues on its current growth trajectory it it could be you know china or china plus so how do we manage those relationships well for the moment uh, at, at present and for the midterm future uh, there are two critical places on earth really where this will play out that's washington and beijing and there's one critical man and that's xi jinping um men which is gender neutral leaders uh, individuals maybe that's the word to use individuals uh, do inflect history or they can um the concerns that we have uh, expressed collectively all revert i think literally all revert to to one man in the past uh, 12 years it's it's very consequential word 
Deng Xiaoping or almost an infinite number of other uh, Chinese um, in Xi Jinping's position, uh, we wouldn't have talked about most of, or we would not be concerned about most of the issues other than global warming, which, which is an existential one for, for us all. So how do we manage it? Um, the, the, no one has ever, um, it being um, the rise of a great power and the change of what has been an international order. Uh, Atul talked about the post-war order for 75 years. It's been, broadly speaking, a, a liberal normative of Pax Americana, uh, which is not to say America does everything right or it doesn't act in its self-interest. That's, that's a given. But nonetheless, uh, the unique aspect in history uh, of the Pax Americana has been that while the United States will uh, defend or impose its, its position on issues that it considers of vital national interest, for all but those issues, which sometimes the United States gets wrong, uh, the United States has uh, fostered a system that allows for a challenge and a success on the part of others. It's not an exploitative um, or colonial system. The French can, if they decide, as they did, kick uh, the United States military out of France. Um, Indian companies and individuals can uh, beat the Americans at their own game and literally profit from it. And the Americans benefit from that. Uh, on the whole, the United States has championed and supported uh, that kind of change, uh, that kind of system. Uh, it is only, uh, well, it is the embrace of that system 30 years ago by India, which leads to uh, India's uh, excited excitement today and uh, almost the inevitability uh, that China will become one of the three, four uh, great powers uh, in, in, in the world. Um, it is... Uh, China's, did I say India? I meant to say India. I didn't mean to say China. It is China's embrace of that 30 years more quickly than India uh, that uh, has explained its growth as well as the, the tigers uh, in, in Asia. And the concerns come from Xi Jinping's fundamental uh, misunderstanding of economics and, and uh, what makes a, a dynamic society. He may no longer actually be a communist, or a Marxist, but he is a totalitarian that believes in a very hierarchical, centralized, uh, single party state with uh, one, in his case, man uh, making most of the decisions. This is why Jack Ma and other uh, entrepreneurs um, at best have to be quiet now. Um, they are threats because by being dynamic and successful, uh, even if they don't challenge Xi Jinping's decisions and policies, they, he per perceives them as a threat because it is the loss of some power. Um, totalitarian societies, individuals, regimes, almost invariably um, underestimate and misunderstand uh, democratic systems, specifically usually the United States, uh, thinking that the cacophony, the disorganization, competition, uh, the uh, rivalries are in, in um, almost ungovernable and cannot cohere uh, and they're easy to, um, and are focused on uh, hedonistic, materialistic, selfish uh, pursuits, much of which is true, but it is also true that uh, that makes the birds fly faster. Uh, and so when there is a competition that is existential, uh, at least the United States and Great Britain before it, um, cohered and could focus in a way and bring resources and the key resource is the uh, dynamic uh, web of competitive uh, centers of power and thought uh, and to coordinate them in such a way that it outcompetes uh, the uh, centralized rival. So it all comes down to Xi Jinping, frankly. Um, there are um, hundreds of millions of Chinese who have, uh, which have embraced the norms that I was just describing. Uh, it's in vogue now, certainly by the right in the United States, to criticize American foreign policy towards China from, uh, from 1972 on for having um, been naive and allowed uh, the monster to, to grow when we should have destroyed it. That was 
that's a lunatic um, uh, objective and it's, it's a wrong assessment. I would argue that uh, the American policy of embracing uh, China by bringing it into the WTO, by bringing millions of uh, Chinese to study in the United States has uh, led to a society that is far more um, liberal uh, organically than it ever has been. It's, they are not in power, they are besieged, many of them are now going to jail, uh, but they, I think uh, the post-1979 in particular, but from 1972 on, policy of the United States strategically uh, has, uh, except for the past decade because of one man's success, um, led to, I think, a, a strategic shift uh, in the um, likely uh, trend of, of history, frankly. The worst case, I think, would be what's happening in Ukraine now and what Xi Jinping is doing do threaten uh, the normative order. Uh, what India is doing and the United States' response, I think, shows how uh, the United States has actually always, despite what its critics say, accepted to happen uh, since 1945. Uh, it is inevitable, almost inconceivable, that China, uh, no, no, that India not become um, one of the two or three most influential uh, powers in the international order in the world. And the United States will grouse and be upset that some Indian entrepreneur uh, replaces Google, perhaps. Uh, but uh, it will happen relatively uh, painlessly, and will be accepted by the is accepted by the United States. Uh, in that sense, that's how the United States uh, is responding to the threat of the considered trap. And, and I believe the United States was doing roughly the same towards China. I mean, that was the formal policy of the United States and, and technically still remains it until 2012. So um, I think Xi Jinping is very impressive in many, many ways. And China has done and continues to do astounding things. Uh, and one man doesn't decide the fate of the world generally. But, but I think in this circumstance, and it is a, a historic series of uh, decisions and challenges and trends that we're, we're experiencing. Uh, if Vladimir Putin uh, didn't have a uh, great Russian view of history and Xi Jinping didn't uh, want to recreate uh, the policies of the Gang of Four in 1976, that uh, India's model and the American response to it would be, I think, a Um, Atul, in the context of this growth, the IMF currently predicts that India will account for 22% of global economic growth in fiscal year 22-23. Um, India's government seems more open to trade deals than they have been in the past. Uh, notwithstanding uh, India's partial withdrawal from the um, US-led Indo-Pacific economic framework. Perhaps you could suss out why that is. Um, how do you see this trade policy moving forward? Will it be something that resembles what we saw with China where it's an export-driven economy or will it be something different that will power growth? So, two aspects to your question. Correct me if I've got it wrong. And number one, of course, the high figure of growth, which the IMF predicts. And number two is India's policy on free trade, particularly in the light of withdrawal from the US-led Indo-Pacific economic framework. Correct? Yeah. Brilliant. OK. Look. Uh, India is going to grow uh, dramatically in the coming years because, as Sunil said, the fundamentals are there. Young population, consumption, massive infrastructure boom going on. I mean, you, we've driven you around a wee bit. Everywhere there is construction, metros, roads. If you go further out, ports, new air, airports. 
uh, I would argue if you if you land in Mumbai, the experience is a lot more pleasant than landing in New York in JFK or Delhi. The wait times in Heathrow are much longer. So as of now, India is going through a similar burst of energy that as the US did in the post-war period when the interstate highways were built. And of course, you have the GST, which cannot be underestimated. Remember, when India got independent, it was a political union, but not an economic union. The EU was more of an economic entity than India. India was fragmented. There were so many restrictions. You couldn't sell into another state. Well, when it came to agriculture, you couldn't sell into another district. It was a Soviet-inspired model. The farmer had to go to the government-designated mandi, which is the Indian word for a local market, and sell at the fixed price. And there were brokers who took commission. And the Indian administrative service, the heaven-born service of India, the mandarins, basically, were the parasites, even more so than politicians, who ended up either extracting deference or hush hush off the record on the QT payments to allow industry to function, paying people. I, we have industrialists in the audience. Paying people was the norm. 17 inspectors would show up. The health inspector would show up, you'd have to pay him off. The labor inspector would show up, you'd have to pay him off. Someone else would show up and they'd say, oh, your, your meter is in the wrong place. Oh, your, your, your floor is not too smooth. The cost of doing business for entrepreneurs and in industry was horrific and money flowed up the chain. And so all of that, I, I wouldn't say it's gone, but all of that is receding. India still has the remnants of socialism. In Hindi, people are called sahibs or adhikaris, which means they are the big lords and they have rights. The word kartavyakari is never used for bureaucrats. Kartavya means duties. They have no duties. They are lords. And so that, but that culture is changing and changing dramatically. A lot of people now question the bureaucracy and the political leadership has decided that ease of doing business is important. And so India is set for a protracted period of economic growth, young demography, infrastructure, a common market through GST, and the clipping of the wings of the bureaucracy, the red tape, very important. There's a fifth element, which is important, and that is simple. And that is that capital has been flowing into India over the last few decades. It's not Yesterday, it is not two years ago, it began in 1991, and it is flowing even to communist states like Kerala. Even Kerala, run by the Communist Party, has got on the entrepreneurial bandwagon. So there is a political consensus now that we want capital, we want entrepreneurship, we want to move forward. And yes, there are pitfalls, and Sunil has pointed out nature and neighbors, there are many, but unless we had a full-blown war, a two-front war, or maybe a four-front war with two oceans involved, unless we had things like that, we are set. Or the water table, which has been going down dramatically in the entire north, and the glaciers have been melting. And if we had two or three bad monsoons, we've had, been, we've, we've had good fortune we've, of having good monsoons. We've been lucky. We've been fortunate. But say we have a few bad monsoons, we could be in trouble. But barring that, we are set for a period of high growth. Thankfully, it's long overdue. So the IMF prediction, yeah, it's for the next year, 7.5. That's important, maybe. But what's more important is that the fundamentals are there, the drivers are there for a period of protracted growth. Now, this brings us on to the question about free trade. And here, Glenn and I are going to differ because Glenn comes with his post-war idea and his economic education in the model that came after 1945, which is free trade good and protectionism bad. And my response invariably, you know, Glenn will smile 
I, I mean problematic like the French uh, Sardepon. It depends. After all, the first act of the US Congress, the first act after the constitution was drafted and everything was a protectionist act. And the US stole industrial secrets from Europe. And thank God they did that. Otherwise they would have been supplying cotton to British mills in Lancashire and Yorkshire. Instead, the US decided to have an industrial policy to industrialize part of the rift between the North and the South was an economic rift. The South wanted to sell cotton to the UK, Britain, Great Britain, because they would have got a higher price. The North said, let's have a bet on industrialization. The South sells its cotton to us. We have our own industries. We become mighty. We move up the value chain. The terms of trade, trade move in our favor. So fast forward, look at Japan. How did it industrialize? Protectionism was part of the mix. South Korea, protectionism was part of the mix. Protectionism didn't work in India because this was implemented by a colonial bureaucracy called the Indian Administrative Service who, were, who all came from St. Stephen's College at that time, not now. They didn't know any numbers and they, 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 they had no idea of, of what to bet on. And they brought in so much red tape that it failed catastrophically. Catastrophe, it was a catastrophe. But India is wary of a complete free trade um, agreement because post 1991, in a way we outsourced our industry to China. We paid a huge price for opening up our markets. And at the end of it, we got the short end of the stick in 2020. And Glenn and I have written a 13,000 word article looking at the history of India-China relations, which those of you interested in go and read up. Uh, that at the end of this, instead of closer relations with China, we ended up getting aggression. So when it comes to a free trade, area, we are wary. We want to develop our domestic industry. We want the ability to make rifles. We want the ability to make guns. We want the ability to make aircrafts. We want transfer of technology. None of this will happen without a certain degree of circumspection when it comes to free trade. We want trade, but it has to be ring-fenced to allow us to grow in strategic sectors important to the future of our nation. So the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, tomorrow we could be back in it. If we feel that our interests are served, Glenn says time and time again, every country follows its national interests. And if it serves our national interests, we'll be back. We are open to negotiation. You know, if Glenn and I were in, were in government, we could have sorted it out over scotch or wine. We are not. Uh, and similarly, when it comes to free trade arrangements with other countries, uh, we have signed one with Australia. And hopefully, we will sign one with the UK. The UK is under duress. So we are open to free trade agreements or trade agreements. I wouldn't call them free trade agreements. But they have to be in sync with a vision of a more secure nation. To that point, I was reading today that textile manufacturers are quite keen to have trade agreements while those who own wineries are terrified of them, that they think they'll get eaten alive. Um, yeah. There are always winners and losers in trade, always. And the idea is if you are a net winner through trade as a nation, you have to compensate the losers. This is a lesson of globalization. The US did not do that. The Rust Belt suffered. And therefore, you have the revenge of the left behinds. Or as in, in, in uh, England, they say uh, the Loch Ness monsters appears, the swamp monsters appeared to eat away uh, uh, the desire for a European Union. And now you have Brexit. So you have to compensate losers. And for us, we'll have to do that as well. The lessons are there.
Uh, Neil Dara, I, I heard Atul talk about technology transfers and in my discussions with um, Indian businesses and government officials they, with regard to the quad, they always say, oh, we want technology transfers. And I always tell them, well, it doesn't quite work that way. Uh, the, the Chinese help themselves to whatever is or isn't nailed down. I suppose that's a technology transfer of a kind, but the US isn't keen on just giving away technology. Um, so my interest is in how India is going to insource tech rather than saying, give us tech, give us tech, give us tech. You know, what, what is India doing well or maybe not so well um, in, in creating these businesses. I read that it looks like they're planning a manned lunar mission, I think. So they're doing something right. Uh, but how do you think India can develop its own technology? Um, perhaps begin by investing more in R&D or research development. Um, yeah, so I think recognizing and prioritizing education fundamentally, or um, bootstrapping institutes of higher education that do both teaching and research, um, encouraging STEM uh, growth, uh, all of that. I mean, also encouraging not just not just the engineering in the STEM, but also the sciences, mm -hmm. because well, fundamental science research takes time to translate but it is fundamental for a reason. Uh, Sunil can probably talk more about the vaccine success story that mm. we, have, uh, we have had. It's very significant. Yeah. She's absolutely right. Investing in technology and science is important. And part of that will come from changing the education system from rote learning to experimentation to, to trying new things working with your hands instead of just focusing on clearing entrance examinations. Uh, Manish Jain is here uh, from the Center of Creative Learning and he does extraordinary work in getting people to try and understand science through simple toys, through play, through building things with their hands. And I think those are the sorts of effects that will help us um, get technology, develop indigenous technology. And of course, when it comes to transfer, et cetera, uh, there might be a quid pro quo, but I'll let Sunil speak because he's from the pharma sector and Glenn wants to have a word in, so I'll stop. Uh, I'd like to share uh, two observations. One is that uh, I'm associated with a company that developed the world's first DNA-based vaccine for COVID right here in Ahmedabad. And our experience of doing this is that the kind of talent that we have today in India is capable of handling this at a substantially lower cost, roughly between 10 to 20% of the cost of R&D globally. Partly is the cost of developing the molecule, but the main saving comes from the clinical trials that follow, the stage two, stage three, and then the general one. Uh, the, other ex uh, the other component of why the kind of explosive R&D doesn't happen in India today, and I'll give you an example. The research and development budget of Pfizer in the US is more than the size of the Indian pharma industry. I'll repeat this for you to understand the scale at which the Indian, Indian pharma industry is the 10th largest in terms of value but the third largest in terms of volume. But the prices of our medicines are one-tenth to one-fifty-fiftieth of the prices that are exist in the OECD countries, including the US. And I repeat, the R&D budget of Pfizer is bigger than the size of the Indian pharma, domestic Indian pharma market. Now, in this challenging environment, when your profitability is severely limited because of the price constraints that the government has placed partially and partially because there, is, there isn't that kind of an affording population or the ubiquitous availability of health insurance in the country that you are limited in terms of what you can charge for your medicines. This precludes the possibility of having bumper profits 
which can then be deployed successfully for very large clinical trials or subsequently for any other new development. So bridging this gap, the pharma industry in India and many other sectors have tied up with niche companies globally. For example, there is a Karolinska Institute in Sweden, which is a world famous for their cutting edge knowledge in, this, in the biosciences. Similarly in Switzerland and similarly in some parts of Boston and in Israel. So the approach that the Indian pharma has taken to beat the problem of inability to fund large research in themselves is to request for research collaborations in these companies who can then draw funds from their own governments to work on projects jointly because these are friendly countries. And this model has worked because business will find a way to overcome their limitations in terms of their own revenues. But the constraint remains that you know we are not in a position. In addition to all these problems during the pandemic, the government asked the pharma industry in India, how come you guys are not producing this so many APIs, the essential ingredients of pharma? And we in pharma said, we were producing these 53 ingredients, which are of paramount importance for strategic reasons, for things like your cough and cold and antibiotics. But we were producing it, but China produces with a 20% lower cost. So our facilities have now been transferred to producing other things. And all these things were being imported from 2016 onwards. With the break in supply chain, the government said, can you go back and reactivate your plan? So we sat down with the paper and pencil to find out where is the cost difference actually coming in the manufacturing. And these are the results and they are quite interesting. The net cost difference of, of an API, there were 53 APIs that migrated out of India into China and they were available at 20%. The difference of 20% was constituted in three major categories. One was the general infrastructure costs, your electricity, your roads, your, you know, all the things that go into it which accounted for 4% out of the 20%. The second was logistics. The logistics cost in China is about 7% of turnover. In India, it is about 14% of turnover. And that accounted for the other balance of about 5-6%. But the large 10-12% to difference was because of the scale of operations of the Chinese API manufacturers compared to our relatively pygmy size operations. That's why I want to add further to the point that Chris raised about PLI, the production linked incentive schemes. Indian government, Indian psychology, Indian policy making has been entrenched deeply in assisting only for the small and medium scale. Industry. We had that monopolies trade and restrictive trade practices, even as early as 1955, 1960, that did not allow the Tatas and the Birlas to become the J.P. Morgans and the Jack Welshers of the world because it was constrained by law not to grow beyond a certain point way back in history. Whereas in the history of economic development in the U.S., there was no such restriction on competitiveness which came in much, much later. Now, this socialist policy of thinking did not allow the growth of large conglomerates to scale up to a level where raw materials could be produced at a cost which was comparable to China. And therefore, we have a situation where our large companies are mid-cap companies in the world and our small and medium scale companies, you really have to look with the magnifying glass to find out where they are. The entire scale of operations is much smaller here. And that accounts for a big thing. The PLI for the first time in the history of India is aiming to set this right. If you mentioned IT, electronics and other things, Today, we have 32 companies which have been selected in India to actually take on the challenge of building very large companies in every dimension, in every sector. And there are 13 PLI schemes, which include almost all the major strategic areas of interest where a large company will be allowed to become very large without being constrained by MRTP Act in absolute terms. The logic of the Indian government is Let's create large companies, but let's create a lot of large companies. Therefore, there is enough competition to regulate that rather than limit them from becoming large altogether. And this is a fundamental shift that has taken place in policy making in India. And that is why I am bullish that this growth that we are now seeing will help us to anchor, including the defense industries, 
including ship making, including aeroplanes, including solar cells, including textile and textile equipment and automobiles and automobiles, all are going to be encouraged to become from large to super giant global giant. But this departure in policy, I am personally very bullish about. Thank you. I, I do, yeah. I think it's a complimentary uh, remark uh, or a, a Venn diagram of uh, mutually reinforcing overlapping sets. The two uh, experiences or two uh, issues that I worked on uh, before I left, before I retired from the CIA, I think um, uh, speak directly to the, to the question and uh, how uh, India or how, frankly, any nation can respond to the issues of uh, technology, competition, economic competition, uh, the merits or demerits of an industrial policy and or protectionism. While I was the um, deputy national intelligence officer, uh, a number of congressmen uh, came, they didn't physically come, they, they presented a collectively a, um, called a requirement, a request to answer a question. They said, uh, we are concerned about uh, China's uh, competition and that China is stealing American technology. Please identify, this is exactly what it was, please identify the five critical technologies that the United States should protect uh, to maintain uh, American superiority. So we looked at the question, and of course we tried to answer it. And our answer was, you've asked the wrong question and framed it incorrectly, which was a rather daring thing to say <laughs> to our political masters. Um, but we said, um, technology changes so rapidly that um, it is impossible to identify what patents we should protect or what specific technologies. If we choose X, literally, and, and I think you will know this better than I, but this was the, this is not just a figurative statement, literally within six months uh, in the cutting edge technologies, the patents were already obsolete. So we could not uh, protect anything effectively. And furthermore, if we did protect them, assuming we could identify them correctly, which we cannot, uh, we will guarantee, and the George Will, the columnist, uh, I'm stealing a, a, a metaphor, uh, that he made years and years ago about protectionism. He said, we will guarantee that the United States have the finest saddle and boot uh, industry in the world uh, at a time when uh, electric cars are, are dominating the industry. So that we cannot do that. What we, the way, however, to answer your question, to achieve what the question uh, wants us to, to answer, uh, to provide, uh, is to identify what is the, what are the qualities or what attributes, what technologies, what what is it that has given the United States technological and economic uh, dominance and superiority? One of them is scale, certainly, and 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 uh, the amount of uh, research and development funds is critical. Uh, the United States did a wonderful job, uh, aside from being the overwhelming beneficiary of the destruction of World War II. Uh, you know, in 1945, the United States had literally over 50% of the global GNP. Um, it also did well in policy for 30 to 40 years in investing at a strategic national level, as well as the more organic level of uh, individual companies and universities and research centers and so on, in devoting a large proportion of its uh, resources to research and development that has dropped off over the decades. The effects lag by, who knows, a decade or, or so, but the United States is um, starting to confront the consequences of a progressively diminished devotion of resources to research and development. So the second part of the uh, issue was, um, we received another uh, request uh, for from, uh, Congress and they said, uh, we are very concerned about China as uh, a rival. And uh, it seems uh, we, are, we are concerned that uh, Chinese students come uh, learn our techniques, uh, study in our schools, and then go home and take our knowledge to defeat us. So um, 
look into that. They, they weren't asking us for policy recommendations. The intelligence community doesn't make policy recommendations. So what we found was at that time, there had been, as I recall, uh, 500,000 Chinese graduate students who had come to the United States to study. Uh, from the time of the opening, which was 79, I think, uh, until early 2000s when I was doing this. Uh, and we said that we found that it is true. 100,000 of them uh, returned to China and are beating their brains out with uh, their knowledge. But it is also true, and this is literally the truth, 400,000 of them sought to remain in the United States. And they enriched literally uh, the United States economic research and development uh, and intellectual base um, exponentially more than four to one uh, by the contributions that they made to the American strength, uh, however you wish to define strength. So then we, we said the way to protect American superiority in our assessment uh, is not to restrict the competition from brilliant Chinese students who wanna go home and, and do brilliant things for China instead of the United States, and not to identify the next saddle and boot manufacturing, tech, manufacturing technology, but to, to, to protect and to nurture, to foster the web of associations, institutes, universities, uh, companies, think tanks, uh, and to uh, endow them or to, to uh, direct to them uh, as, much, as many resources as it is possible to do for a society as a whole, for the country to do, so that you have Stanford and Harvard and Massachusetts Bay Community College and brilliant students from India and China uh, all coming and trying to beat our daylights out, but doing it in our institutions. And it's because we don't try to choose a winner, but that we do try to foster a uh, challenge and competition. And that's what we protect. That explains why the United States economy and, and having vast resources to deploy to these things uh, that explain why the United States has been uh, up until that point, uh, the dominant power. Uh, it, there are other factors too, but that's the fundamental factor for technological, economic, scientific, um, uh, dominance, and that that is how to uh, maintain this. It was an answer that one party uh, didn't like to hear at all, um, and the other party embraced, but that gets into you know, challenges in our own system, American system. Uh, and just one last comment is slightly, uh, it's, it's a somewhat different subject, but related. The, the challenges for India uh, and for the United States uh, certainly for the United States, are not uh, from without. China is a challenge. Indian companies will threaten and, uh, and beat American companies sometimes. There will be political tensions. War is a danger. All of these things are, are real. I'm not dismissing or diminishing their importance. Uh, but American uh, policymakers uh, like to compare America to Rome. Uh, it is an imperial republic. If you see Washington, it's an imperial a city designed by design intentionally, the architecture. Uh, but Rome wasn't destroyed by the barbarians. Rome was destroyed because over two centuries, really, that the nature of Roman society changed. Uh, and that's what could destroy America. And uh, Atul alluded to uh, um, the issue that, that currently and, and for a long term, is probably the existential challenge to the American system, and thus actually to the global order. And that is the reaction by people who look like me, the historically dominant group in the United States, to the changes of American society and to the challenges from without, which have never existed before. America has been largely an autark autarkic economy, even after 1945, the percentage of of foreign trade, the relevance of non-Americans in any way to American life has been inconsequential compared to how it is for every other nation on earth. That's not the case 
any longer. China is phenomenal in many things. India is rising rapidly. The European Union makes better airplanes than Boeing. None of this happened before. Um, international trade and free trade, and I'm not a doctrinaire free trader, um, does allow cheap textiles from Vietnam to put people in North Carolina out of work. And the reaction to, to that is the foreigner is killing us, so we should kill the foreigner. Let's get these little brown people out uh, because they've changed the nature of America. Uh, I put it crudely, but that's, the, that's what's driving the social discord and thus the political crisis uh, in America and that that can threaten American success. American hegemony will no longer exist uh, as it has up until now because no longer will America, in part by design of American policy, uh, control 50% of the world's GNP. It will be 18 or 16. Uh, even that's frankly three times greater than the American population. Um, so that's, that's the secret that we found uh, to maintain American superiority and that would generate or foster uh, Indian greatness and in how to respond to China. Okay, we've reached the point where all y'all get to ask questions of the crowd up here. There are a couple of rules. Believe me, I'm doing this to spare you pain. Uh, please direct your question to a specific individual. Please make it brief. As Atul says, bikinis, not burkas. And uh, if your question is too imprecise or directed to the entire panel. This is Vivek Modi from Smart Sense Solutions. We're a technology firm here in Gift City. So uh, agreed with all your points that, you know, GDP growth is excellent. Agreed with, sir, that the microeconomic fundamentals are, you know, key drivers to support the Indian economy growth. But I think one point which uh, might impact the short to medium term growth of the country uh, can also be the depletion of the current uh, Indian currency and the global markets versus the US dollar, right? Uh, currently, I think the Fed... Uh, the foreign exchange reserves are being depleted uh, that supports the currency in the short term. Also, uh, there are rumors that by this week, the RBI would be increasing the repo rate that will further support uh, the inflows of foreign uh, funds into the country. Uh, but wouldn't this be, uh, you know, uh, counterproductive to the growth of the country in short to medium term? So my question again directed to Mr. Atul. Unless he agrees not to make me do push-ups, then it's for anyone there. <laughs> Good question. So the Chinese currency fell to a record low today. If you go to BBC, you go to Financial Times, um, and um, that may be problematic for them. Certainly, um, we will pay the price of a higher fiscal deficit and a higher current account deficit. We import all our energy, or most of it anyway. And so we have mitigated the consequences of high energy costs by buying discounted Russian oil, which of course the US and EU don't appreciate, but we have compulsions, we are a, a poor economy, and no politician can see inflation rise above a certain figure. The price of onions determines elections, so we've had to mitigate the consequences of high oil prices as best we can. Whenever interest rates rise, in the US, capital flows back. The Japanese stock exchange has gone down, the Korean as well, Asian markets have suffered. Indian markets so far have been decoupled, but you're absolutely spot on that High energy costs are a risk. How we manage that will determine our own growth, employment, the health of our industry, and indeed the health of our very people. And that might not just involve buying cheap oil for now, but that might involve moving uh, to solar. We have a lot of sun. That might involve more energy efficiency, which we are not that good at as yet. 
that might involve in cooperation of new technology as well that makes us um, get rid of a lot of inefficiency in power distribution, power production, uh, that makes us optimize our existing capacity. So there will have to be creative solutions and they'll have to be quick. Yeah, agreed. So these can be very long term in terms of solutions, but uh, do you think that short term to medium term growth would be impacted? Uh, it is already impacted. We would have had over 10% growth had it not been for the Russia-Ukraine war. Absolutely. It's already been, we, we've already suffered, but we've suffered less than the others. That is it. So um, I don't know whether it is for this panel and uh, uh, maybe Sunil mentioned it. So uh, maybe, uh, and maybe others can share their thoughts. I have a different view of this whole growth thing. And this is something we were talking about three weeks back um, when we did this uh, episode on YouTube where we said uh, this was about, you know, the growth and um, what was the name of the episode? The, the silent pandemic was the name of, I mean, it is happening right now. And you said, if that were to happen, then all this growth story will not happen. If, and and I, I, I sort of relate this to this, um, this uh, 2007, somebody mentioned that crisis. By the way, you said, you know, small, short, I don't know. Uh, this is sort of a long winded question, but I- It's, it's up to, uh, to okay. how many pushups you do. All right. Um, no, but I'm, this, this um, I forget this guy, this, uh, this guy at Stanford who was a doctor who predicted this is going to happen, um, you know, the whole thing and he shot it and made, it is right there in the stars. I mean, people are saying it's going to happen. And we are still saying, oh, it's just one, one degree. Who cares? It's one and a half. I mean, we did these calculations. 50 feet, the water is going to rise. 50 feet. And, uh, and it's just one degree can just change the whole. I mean, look at the things that are happening. This year was supposed to be, this year was supposed to be the heat wave in India in March or April was supposed to have killed, uh, and this was in New York Times, they said uh, 70, some huge number of people will die because of the heat wave. And then the science, they were, they were asking why it didn't happen. Right, you know, uh, I mean, thank God. But in Europe, 2015, things happened. Lots of things happened. It is right thing there in the wall. And somehow we want to ignore it or we say, if it were to happen, then maybe we will not be 7% or 5 And then we worry about whether India is GDP per or it doesn't make any sense. How can India have the same as Iceland or whatever? But I'm saying, why are we sort of not cognizant of supposedly this writing on the wall? And I would like comments from whoever wants to sort of take it. This is the most important issue uh you're specifically just just to add to that you know this this thing about saving the earth let's save the earth dude the earth is saved nothing is going to happen to earth earth will be fine it is you and me who will probably not be here so forget about the earth the earth is totally okay you know you finish we finish as a species yeah. we earth will be back maybe maybe the next day or you know year from now so don't worry let's not worry about the earth Let's just worry about ourselves. Sorry if I just, you know, whichever way. The uh, global warming has been, uh, it, it personally has been my uh, greatest issue or book fear for, for many, many years. I've been personally green my entire life. But um, another insight to the workings of the US government that speaks directly to this. You know, I've been out of, I retired over a decade ago. <clears throat> However, every year, the National Intelligence Council where I worked uh, does a series of uh, annual assessments. There, there are spot assessments, and one is uh, threats to the uh, United States itself. One is global trends and on and on. Consistently in the years that I was working, the greatest threats to the homeland, the assessment of the intelligence community, the, the National Intelligence Council, 
sits at the top of the 17 intelligence agencies in the United States government. All of them report to the National Intelligence Council, which is the only part, the only office, organ in the United States government that speaks with one voice uh, for the intelligence community. The CIA might say, well, the moon is made out of cheese, and the Defense Intelligence Agency might say, no, it's made out of yogurt, uh, and both of those get reported to the White House. We, the National Intelligence Council, are the only ones who say um, there's a conflict, and our assessment is that it's made out of peanut butter or something, but we, we're the only ones who speak for it. So the question was, that we answered in these annual reports, what is the primary threat the ter terrorist threat to the homeland. Uh, and we assessed every year that it was domestic American terrorism, American militias, right-wing libertarians, and so on. Those who caused the greatest uh, damage, killed the most people, and financially the most ruin were eco-terrorists. So that was our assessment. Those are the facts. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's not even an assessment. It's simply collating, collecting the data and saying there, there were 50,000 militia members uh, training to kill federal employees, and there are 300 members of Al-Qaeda. We were ordered um, to remove that, and we could say only that Islamic terrorism was the top threat to the United States. And that was a political decision by the uh, leadership in the White House at the time. I'll tell you who it was if you want. Um, the second assessment uh, was what are the gravest issues to, uh, to the United States and, and what are the factors that will most affect uh, international economy, political stability, international relations, and so on. And uh, no later than, I don't have firsthand insight prior to the year 2000, but I do from then, because I was directly involved in it from 2000 through 2007. The top threat to all of these issues of stability and growth was global warming. And we have laid out every year here this, we do not know the future exactly because perhaps Xi Jinping won't be president, perhaps he will be, uh, who knows. Uh, but here are three scenarios of the most probable, you know, least you know, middle range and then uh, you know, the most. And uh, the scenario said that there will be, we affirmed, we didn't just think that it was a possibility, there will be increasing dramatic political instability as a result of global warming. The Syrian war has been attributed largely to two things. Most non-Americans and most Americans will say, well, America invaded Iraq, destroyed the country, and screwed everything up in the Middle East. And so Syria, because it's adjacent, couldn't cope with the overspill of terrorists and refugees and so on. And there's much truth to that. What isn't known is that there was a severe drought. Syrian farmers could not grow any crops. They were starving. And they also were, were destitute. They couldn't stay on their farms. They became refugees within their own country. They moved to the Syrian urban areas, the Syrian cities. Syria as a government was unable, it did not have the resources and or the competence to handle this internal flow of refugees because of a drought, which we assessed had been made more severe because of the trends of global warming. The society collapsed. It happened to have the bad luck was that it happened at the same time as the American invasion of Iraq, and uh, which you can argue helped to catalyze um, indigenous jihadist groups in Syria that added to the chaos. We also have said that there's an, uh, and Samuel Huntington wrote about this decades ago, um, there's an arc of instability and it's, it's largely um, majority Muslim societies from Morocco across the Middle East um, to Pakistan that have unsustainable, and all of us know this, unsustainable demographic uh, growth in the birth, birth rates. Even though the birth rates are, are dropping everywhere in the world, they're not dropping fast enough. 
there's a correlation between political violence and instability and a higher proportion than uh, historically in single males between the ages of 18 and, and 25. And that's what you have. Testosterone is the greatest evil in the world. And it's only half a joke. Um, so these things were forecast, assessed, known. We know, and we have warned. I was part of the one who wrote this, and, I, and I'm not the only, I, I just happen to be one, but it, it's not, I'm not claiming to have had this insight myself, that the water table in the plains of Northern India has dropped, I forget the exact figure, but it's something like 30 or 50 meters. The same is true in the Southwest of the United States. Not only has the water table dropped, I mentioned this to someone, I forget who it was exactly, this is one of my favorite little factoids. The Colorado River, one of the great rivers in the entire continent, no longer reaches the ocean. It's all sucked up. Not only has the water table in the Southwest of the United States, where Americans insist on growing lawns in the desert with, by watering it, but that the water table has fallen, but the actual land, the ground has sunk, not just that there's a sinkhole, but an entire region by something like 10 meters because the water table is gone. It takes 40,000 years to replace a water table. So we said that all of this will happen. One third of Bangladesh is likely to disappear in the next 25 years. It will become ocean. One third of Florida will disappear. The back bay, the chic area of my home city in Boston is reclaimed land from a hill in the town three kilometers away where I grew up. It was under, it was below sea level until 1870. It will once again become tidal marsh. Uh, so these things were known, were warned, and the intelligence community doesn't make policy. Yeah, yeah, and, and somehow just and, and just finish up. I think the whole idea that this is just water will rise, so I can go climb the mountain. I will go to Ambaji Temple and I'll be fine because it's you know 100 feet or however many feet. It is not about that. It's not just water rising. It's the you know the kind of changes that will happen is something that, you know, some links in, in whatever we see and we have no idea. I mean, we have an idea to what extent it will be. So, but we have no idea of, of what they will be exactly and how we're going to deal with it. Well, it's so just, in my opinion, yeah. you know, this, this, this thing that you mentioned, Sunil, it, it's not just a small if this happens. I mean, that is something that has... But let me, let me, let me also get back to you on this. And, uh, you know, you are absolutely right. If you were present in COP26 during the inaugural, there were five prime ministers and presidents of developing countries, which included Trinidad and Tobago. It included Mauritius, who are facing an existential crisis. It's not about going on the hill. There is no hill there. The country will be gone. And they have made a plea in such words and such terms that it really makes everybody sit and think up what has happened. But the reality is completely different. Following the discussion in 2005 and the agreement in 2015, where the developed countries had promised to give $100 billion a year to developing countries who don't have the finance or the technology, not even a billion dollar has come so far. Now, if you expect Mauritius and Trinidad and Tobago to say, I'm going to die, so what am I going to do? It's not going to solve anybody's problems. He doesn't have the resources. The entire effort of the global community in 26 and now in Sharm El Sheikh in 27 is to further drive home the point that you're going to need technology. You're going to need money. And forget about mitigation. First, with the issue will be adaptation. When that happens, how the hell are you going to be able to manage the devastation that is going to follow? And I think. While your plea is heartfelt, I entirely agree with you and everybody here shares your anxiety. But the reality is India as a country has contributed to only 4% of the total emissions which is there, which is 300 billion tons. Out of the 52 billion tons that are ejected of carbon in the year, India ejects 2.8 billion tons. What do you expect me as a company or Gujarat as a state or India as a country to do about it? The problem is elsewhere. Thank you. Uh, 
Okay, who's up next? We have talked about the Indian economy and school. And we also talked about the concerns in growth of Indian economy. Hold your mic closer. Okay, okay. Am I clear to you now? We have talked about growth of Indian economy and the concerns in it. Uh, there were two concerns according, regarding it, our nature and never. But I think there's another concern regarding the Indian economic growth, that is its social diversity. I mean, I don't think any society or country can grow if it has so many diversity in social structure. So what do you want to say about the social structure of Indian economy and, and its growth? Please. Is there someone specifically to Atul, whom you? Mr. Atul, sir. I knew it was coming. It's an important question, and the answer is difficult. If we look at growth, Latin America grew dramatically in bursts, but Latin America is a very stratified society. So growth did not really benefit everyone. They have the highest murder rates in the world. Most of the most murderous cities are not in the Middle East, not even in Africa. They're in Latin America, where the descendants of the conquistadores, the Spanish who colonized Latin America, rule like lords over mixed race, mestizos, and indigenous peoples. So when you have a very diverse country like India, inequality could cause massive strain and growth would not be sustainable or long-term. That is absolutely true. Therefore, in India, you can see right since independence, there has been an effort, howsoever imperfect, to curb inequality. You have the reservation policy, you have subsidies, you have meals being given to children, and so on and so forth. But as Neil Dhara said earlier, India will have to really invest in certain fundamentals. What are those fundamentals? Basic education to everyone, better nutrition for everyone, healthcare for everyone, water, clean drinking water for everyone. And some outdoor space where people can just walk around, forget gyms, forget fancy swimming pools, just spaces where people can walk around. Because in India, you're absolutely right. The complexity is incredible. You have villages where people are malnutrition, where people lack protein, where children are stunted. Then you come to cities and you have an epidemic of diabetes because there's no space for people to, for children to run around. They grow up in a culture of no physical activity. Diet has a very high degree of polished rice, so no roughage. Polished lentils, again, without husks, less roughage. Lots of sugar, lots of white carbohydrates, fewer vegetables. So... India's problems in some ways are more complicated than any other country. And we absolutely have to meet those social challenges if Indian economic growth is to be stable and not just Indian economic growth, but Indian political structures and indeed the Indian nation is to survive intact. Thank you very much. Okay, well. I do want to thank all of you panelists. You've been very kind and the audience has been wonderful and patient. And thank you also for your questions. We're done. Join the conversation at Fair Observer and subscribe to our YouTube channel.